Now, traditionally, one of the strongest economic signals for anyone involved in cattle marketing is that premiums and market access tend to exist for producers who are willing to go the extra mile to produce quality. However, we've also seen that progressive cattle management partnered with progressive cattle marketing is the real opportunity to maximize profits. Luckily for commercial cattlemen, successful feeder calf marketing is not a one-size-fits-all concept. Paul Dykstra, Assistant Director of Supply Management and Analysis for the Certified Angus Beef brand, joins us this morning to share his insight on building an effective feeder calf resume, along with other tips to maximize your cow-calf investment. In Paul's 19-year tenure, he has helped producers understand more about where value is generated beyond the ranch and has provided tools to help orient their herd to capture that value. He also communicates consumer demand signals to cattlemen, analyzing beef market and grading trends in the bi-weekly CAB Insider. Paul, we look forward to hearing what you have to share. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Kara, and uh, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you here this morning on the, uh, <clears throat> the virtual stage. Hope you're all doing well. We'll just queue up uh, some slides here real quick and, and get right into it. When we talk about uh, feeder cattle marketing this morning, I guess the first thing I want to make clear is that um, my, I'm not here to talk to you about risk management. Uh, we're going to talk more, a little more detail about how, you, how to market your own calf crop, uh, specifically uh, regarding merchandising those cattle, rather than so much, uh, you know, your annual strategy, and certainly not getting into some of those details of, of risk management, uh, futures and options, and those kinds of things, just to be clear. Um, throughout my, my average year, I think the most common phone call that I get uh, here at Certified Angus Beef is regarding marketing cattle and how to get a uh, premium from the, the calf crop. Folks want to know how to add value or they think perhaps they have already done so, but now they want to, uh, to get paid for that value. So that's definitely where, uh, where the trick lies in, in marketing. So start off on a little bit lighter note this morning and I don't know, uh, if you're a movie buff, but uh, there was a movie 1991, that movie uh, City Slickers. Some of you will recall that. I can't exactly recommend the movie, not necessarily one of my favorites, but kind of funny in many ways. And if you would recall, if you've seen it, uh, Curly, the old, uh, the old ranch hand uh, cowboy character, uh, at one point in the movie was going to share the one secret of life with Billy Crystal's character. And just as he was about to reveal the, uh, the one secret or the key to life, uh, he killed over dead. So there was never a reveal from, from his knowledge. But I think when it comes to, to feeder cattle marketing, there is, there is one, one key or one secret that I think it would be best if we all keep in mind. That is to just simply think about where does my customer make the most money? Now, our customer as a rancher, as a stalker, who, however we might frame that, our customer is likely the cattle feeder and then on down the chain, the packer and the consumer, et cetera. So as well, that, might, that customer might be ourselves if we choose to retain ownership or find more value in hanging on to those cattle longer. Either way, just think about, you know, what makes my customer money? And if we can pursue that endpoint, I think we're off to a, to a great start in our marketing program. Well, without um, a high quality product, something that has extra value, of course, the marketing becomes a little bit of a moot point. So let's talk a little bit about that product first and what kind of uh, animals we want to be putting out on the market. So we want to think about what are the demand drivers for cattle in the industry today. Uh, there certainly are several different angles we could take with that and different customers have different desires depending on regionality and endpoint market. But there are some overriding themes that I think uh, we could probably point to and we'll get into some of that in a moment. And what time frame will, will our cattle be worth the most when we offer them to the market? That's a very, very key point. Something that's sometimes difficult to manage around, but we'll talk about some of those details. So first of all, in terms of what kind of cattle 
We think about that in two separate uh, uh, frames of mind, I think. Since all cattle have some value, it's really a matter of uh, optimizing or maximizing that, that value. So from, from the buyer's perspective, say the feed yard, if you will, that angle is I want to own cattle that make money. Uh, we've all heard that one. It's a tried and true statement. Uh, you know, not necessarily worried about the, that they be the top front end of the market all the time, but if I can buy cattle that will make money, then I'm interested. So that's the buyer's side. But from the seller's perspective, we need to have a little different point of view. And that is to indeed, I believe, you know, offer cattle that have the most of the best attributes to offer to that feed yard and to the packer and ultimately to the consumer. So that's our end goal. But if we just boil everything down to start with as a very simplistic approach, there are very few key factors that make cattle more valuable to our customer and that is the cattle feeder. Those of you feeders that are on uh, the, the conference this morning, I think could agree that still today, if we can guarantee some degree of health, that would be worth quite a bit. And we know that over time in the past 20 years, you know, death loss has not improved in the feed yard. As a matter of fact, it has become slightly poorer in that time period. Uh, the cost of uh, treating sick cattle in the feed yard also has increased. And so we have those challenges that are actually not getting better, but that are becoming more of a threat or a challenge. So from a ranch perspective, offering up a set of feeder cattle that have the ability to stay healthy, clearly very important. Uh, I'm not your veterinarian nor a consultant, but let's just embrace that, that reality. The second point um, conversion of feed efficiently. We know that's the, that's the number one job of the bovine animal. We're trying to convert uh, the resources on the land uh, to, to healthy beef. And if they can do that efficiently, you know, that's still the bottom line. So I think points one and two on this list uh, go without saying, and, and there's really no argument across any, any feeding environment or customer base. Now, item number three, hanging a premium carcass, uh, we'll go through some details there. That may or may not, of course, be part of the real value uh, proposition for every feed yard, uh, depending on marketing approach and management style. Some feed yards uh, are going to key in more on merchandising cattle on a grid, while some others may have more of a commodity approach, trying to simply be most efficient uh, and selling cattle at one price without a whole lot of price discovery on a carcass basis. So that third point may or may not be true of every operator or every buyer, but in the end, our product has to uh, perform on the plate for the consumer. So we'll talk a little bit about management at the ranch level. Just uh, you've seen some of this before, I'm sure. Lots of talk these days about uh, cal weaning calves prior to delivery. I think we're seeing that come through in the marketplace on these summer video sales. The feed yards I consulted with about the topic, definitely uh, they are less excited about feeding a freshly weaned calf than they've ever been. And they find a lot of value in cattle that have been weaned 45 days, which is hard for some of us to stomach the idea. We used to think 30 was pretty good, but we know now that, and as you can see here in the cattle facts data, that the value of uh, the longer weaned calf certainly is higher. Now there's some cost affiliated with this and uh, certainly owning those calves through the weaning period has some risk as well. But uh, our customers are telling us that the wean calf that's ready to go on feed and is kind of cleaned up as they say is, uh, is the preferred product. So think about that. And certainly looking at this chart here, if we look at the duration of weaning on the right there in the bars, you can see that we only really get a profitable return to uh, that, that weaning or that weaned calf once we get beyond 40 uh, to 45 days or so and on out plus, you know, 60 plus days. Now, I'm not going to suggest that this kind of management works for everyone, but this is the reality of, of the numbers. And I think we ought to be considering alternatives in terms of how to get our calves uh, weaned and on to the next customer. Moving on then to that carcass element and switching gears, you'll notice I jumped right past that feeding performance because I just think it's so basic and, uh, and, and, and well received that everyone understands. We're gonna, we'll go right past that and talk about 
the kind of uh, carcass and end product that the industry is looking for today. And just to give you a quick historical perspective, since the year 2000 up through last year, you can see that the proportion of choice and prime carcasses has dramatically increased, particularly since 2006. Whereas today, you know, we are harvesting 82%, 83% choice and prime. And much, much of the time this year, that prime number has been 10% of the total. So the carcass quality has improved and consequently, the expectations of the packer in the marketplace in general are higher than they were uh, just a handful of years ago. So we need to be cognizant of that in the kind of cattle that we're breeding. Here at Certified Angus Beef, our brand has also seen tremendous growth in the number of animals that are meeting our 10 carcass specifications. Uh, the number of eligible animals also has been on the rise, somewhere in that 70% or just below that in the last few years. But uh, the share of eligible cattle that are making our 10 standards and consequently qualifying is about 35 to 36%. Even though we have more product to sell now at our brand than ever before, the premiums back to the brand continue, although seasonally definitely fluctuating. You can see here at, in relationship to the weekly average fed cattle price, uh, over time, in the last decade, we've seen the certified Angus beef premium paid on grids, by packers, two feed yards for qualifying carcasses uh, on the increase. Again, there's seasonality to this, and I'll show you something regarding that in a moment. But just understand that more supply has not necessarily meant fewer dollars. As a matter of fact, to the contrary, we've seen this summer where the box beef cutout has favored certified Angus beef over choice. Uh, by more of a margin than we've seen it in the last handful of years. So demand is pretty good in the face of really good supplies. Let's talk a little bit about genetics. Uh, I think we really have to key in on genetics as a ranch manager and calf owner. You know, this is kind of our risk management tool. Again, as I speak to those feed yards and consult with them about their opinions, you know, in an up market, you know, the best cattle do exceptionally well. In a down market, the best cattle might uh, keep our head above water and above a break even. So let's look at genetics from a, a risk management perspective in terms of uh, how can we insulate ourselves against the tougher, tougher times. Here's an example of that precise point. And this is my favorite uh, visual aid of the entire discussion. This is carcass data from one group of 600 plus cattle from one owner. And you can see on the left in that scatter plot uh, where each of those carcasses landed on that matrix of quality grade and, and yield grade. So above that uh, horizontal black line, those are all choice and higher carcasses. You can see on the left, we've broken down choice into low, middle, and upper one third, and then prime similarly broken down. And the certified Angus beef brand starting right here, excuse me, at 500 marbling, uh, premium choice. So we've got a lot of carcasses in the premium zone. And then a yield grade across the bottom, the leanest on the left at a yield grade one. And of course, the heaviest uh, fat cover on a yield grade five. So most of those carcasses were either uh, at par, no premium or discount for yield grade, or they were actually yield grade two or one. Most importantly, on the right here in this table, you see all of the, uh, the facts and figures from these cattle. You got the percent quality grades and yield grades down on the left side. I think you would have to agree, pretty exceptional type of cattle. 18% uh, prime, 50% certified Angus beef, and 76% choice. Of course, those CAB carcasses could also uh, be included in that choice grade. And the uh, yield grades down the left here as well. When we get to the bottom, there's a net carcass adjustment on a per hundred weight basis. That equivalent on this particular set of cattle was $88.19 per head on a choice select spread of about $10 I used. So a pretty modest or average um, choice select spread for this calculation. If we take that back to the feeder calf then, uh, due to genetics and superior carcass traits, that 600 pound calf would have been worth another $14 in change above, you know, per hundred weight above the market. So that's a pretty exceptional example of the kind of cow we need to be 
we need to be looking for from a carcass perspective and offering to our clientele. Now, summer let's look at the summer video information and talk about added value. I can't slow down enough to talk about this and give it the due diligence, but folks, I'm gonna tell you that today's marketplace, these, these programs, program cattle, as we've talked a lot about and heard a lot about, they are really bringing a, a very decent premium above the market. These 2019 premiums are not the same as this year, but still, I think representative, probably add a few dollars to these uh, natural and non-hormone treated cattle, those NHTCs this year. Definitely seeing, in some cases, above $10 per hundred weight premiums for cattle enrolled in these programs. Now, not all of these particular programs uh, would roll cattle into the certified Angus beef brand, but folks, let's just face it, we wanna get involved in the items that bring a premium back to the ranch. And I think consideration of enrollment in these programs is, is pretty essential if you want to put all of the icing on the cake. Okay, switch over and talk a little bit about timing. Uh, this uh, kind of a fun quote about timing, it's nearly everything and what it isn't, you know, circumstances make up for. And how important is that to the, uh, to the cattle business? I think that sums up a lot of the things that we do. And marketing a set of feeder calves is not necessarily any different. The cattle facts data, once again, I think clearly delineates on a 550 pound steer that there are times of the year that we are best to not sell one and times of the year that reward us the most. So the green circle on the left in the spring, March, April timeframe shows us, although the 10 year index is really high, but most recently, maybe not quite as accentuated, but still a good pop there in the spring. Whereas where most of us, uh, their spring calvers are selling calves in the fall, maybe even in October. We just have to realize that might be the worst time of the year to offer those calves for sale. Now, maybe management dictates that we have to do that, but just understand that timing is huge. So if we make decisions that target that a little bit better, maybe we manage cattle into a different season. Here's the, uh, the other side of that coin, the fed steer price. Again, what does our customer make money at? Our customer probably makes the most money offering cattle in the spot market in the spring of the year when demand is high and high quality grading cattle are fewer and farther between. And also in the, in the winter time prior to the Christmas holidays, we tend to get a fed cattle market pop. So let's offer cattle that meet that time frame as best we can and I think we'll get along better. Here's an example off of a recent summer video sales summary. Here's the heifer calf or the heifer summary of that entire sale. And I thought it was real telling, you know, if we're selling a heifer weighing 450 to 500 pounds, and that heifer brings us back $723, we might be able to actually hold the ranch together. Might be a little premium still, our margin, uh, I should say, above operating costs for those that uh, manage um, for that. But if we hold that heifer to the next summer, and sell her as a yearling, she could have been worth, in this very simplified example, $1,266. So is there a system or considerations that we can make to make that heifer older and actually make her a premium rather than a byproduct of the ranch? Um, you know, just some food for thought. Here's some more of that seasonal demand in terms of, again, back to the carcass value. Uh, you can see that, you know, if you're offering high quality cattle with carcass traits built in, we ought to be thinking about when do we sell those. Now, the 2019 data line is pretty wild due to uh, the post Kenny County fire marketplace we had, but the, these lines here, and including this year, are much more seasonal in line with what we see over time. So think about when we're going to have those cattle for sale and when do they finish and capitalize then on the carcass quality that we've built in. You know, here's an image now going into some marketing discussion. If you drive enough miles across the country, you see some funny things. And I thought this was pretty funny on my travels last spring. Um, this, this little sign outside of somebody's ranch gate, you know, beef for sale right there by the trash barrel. I couldn't help but stop and wonder if these folks really cared if they got any beef sold or not, but they sure weren't gonna sell any to me on that day. So we can do better in our marketing than that. Here's a guy that's marketing himself down the road, needing to ride 
with his thumb in the air heading to Jacksonville. So that's kind of sales more than marketing. But he's if he improves his game a bit here and improves his message on his sign, now he's actually selling himself and uh, putting himself out there in a way that's a little bit more compelling. I'm gonna skip past this one quickly. I think you're all pretty aware of how we market cattle in the country. I just wanted to highlight the fact that most of the cattle that we're selling from the ranch level anyway are still going through auction barns. Um, and so we need to be aware that when we're talking about marketing, we're not just talking about direct sales. We're sure not talking about only video sales, but the majority of cattle going through auction barns and we need to think about how we effectively market those animals. And I'll slow down a second here and talk about networking, which I think is the number one key to merchandising feeder cattle. The number one key to merchandising feeder cattle. Most of us that raise a cow are probably having a lot more fun staying home at the ranch, taking care of cattle. And that's a lot of the reason why we do what we do. If you're a full-time rancher, what have you, maybe your forte is not getting out and getting across the country and meeting people and shaking hands. But I think it's so important to you that I would challenge each of you on the ranch side, if you don't have contacts and relationships at the feed yard level, uh, or the broker level, if you will, or the marketing agent, uh, I would encourage you to spend some time at least on the phone, if not jumping in the pickup and making a little tour, seeing and finding some feed yards that might be potential customers for your cattle. Because face it, when we've got several, several thousand cattle for sale on a given day, it's really hard to stand out. We want to have, I think when it comes marketing day, we want to have those relationships that somebody knows who you are, knows your product, and the fact that you've laid out all of the qualifications and, and, um, and, and bred in and managed in attributes of your calves prior to sale day. So I would encourage you to get out and make those relationships, make the phone calls. It might take five calls to find out who you need to call but I think it's that important. Doesn't matter if you sell 10 head in the auction barn, 200 head on the video, or if you want to try to merchandise cattle direct in the country, this business operates best, I think when people have a comfort level with one another uh, and, and the familiarity to go ahead and, and be able to purchase those cattle at a premium. Back to some of those qualifications now, once you've you know, managed the cattle the best you can at the ranch, in terms of the genetic inputs, purchasing the higher end uh, uh, genetics to, to build into your cow herd, again, I think it's important to document you know, that this is the, the era that we're in. It's not just about um, putting out a nice set of, say for instance, in our world, you know, nice set of black hided calves that look like they'll get the job done. We can check some more boxes, folks, and and ensure some things or at least answer some questions through documentation that folks are looking for. We talked about non-hormone treated cattle and natural. These programs offered by the Angus Link Program at the American Angus Association, I think check the boxes rather well. Several ways that we can verify some things that we've done at the ranch. Sometimes buyers are even purchasing cattle enrolled in these programs uh, and then they're not actually keeping the cattle enrolled for, you know, marketing to the packer. It's simply uh, a statement that, you know, if we're checking all these boxes, if the ranch and that ranch management team cares enough to do the marketing to, to enroll cattle in these um, value-added programs, then the likelihood is they're doing everything else they can in terms of management genetics to make a premium product. And that's what feed yards often are looking for through these verifications. So um, really something to consider. I'm gonna kind of head on through toward the end here, talk a little bit about building a resume. This might sound a little funny um, and far-fetched to you, but you know there are thousands and thousands of cattle sold every year that actually do have a resume behind them. If you look in these video sale catalogs, or if you look at the daily uh, marketing sheet at your local uh, marketing auction, you know, you'll see a resume for lots of cattle with plenty of detail. And these items on the screen now are too numerous to go through you know, one by one, but very commonplace items that we see. And you know, while, while descriptive, 
I think we could probably do better on an individual ranch basis if we're truly trying to push the envelope. How do we describe the true genetic superiority and management advantages for our calves? So I would, I would press folks to add some extras to the resume. Now these things may not, you know, of course, they may not fit into your marketing firm's um, uh, propaganda, not into their, their catalog or their listing sheet, but perhaps you design your own and, and send it on to a list of potential buyers. And I would recommend that we explain some things further to our customers and clientele, particularly as it relates to genetics. You know, I think we've got every kind of cattle feeder in the country with knowledge, you know, from one end of spectrum to the other. But let's just assume that our customer doesn't know as much about our product as we do. I think that's a good place to start. So if we're going to talk about cattle that are royally bred, that have the genetics bred in for generations, etc., well, let's describe that with some more detail. You know, let's talk about not only, you know, they're highly bred for marbling, they're highly bred for ribeye area or game. Let's quantify those things in terms of percentiles. Um, show that buyer, hey, the bulls that we buy are in the top X percent of the breed for this and that trait. Help them understand and digest why you believe they should bid one more time. I think that's really getting to the, uh, the icing on the cake when it comes to our marketing program. Do you have feeding and carcass history on the cow? You know, I, I think if we can achieve that, I know some would say it's very difficult to get, but if you have a true desire, you know, maybe you find out from a feed yard, you know, how those cattle feed, can I get some data? You know, don't, don't use that as a weapon against that feeder uh, when he's trying to buy the calves from you next year, but perhaps 10 years down the road when you don't have that relationship anymore, you know, that data may do you, do you some good. And then also market the extra details such as, you know, BQA certification, just added ways to show the cattle feeder that, hey, we care enough to uh, take care of all of the specifics that we know are important to the industry. Marketing materials, um, just about finished here, but I, you know, this letter from 2008, one of my very best references of all time. This was a, a letter written on a typewriter, put through a copy machine and sent out to cattle feeders. This is just one segment of what I thought at the time was a pretty good you know, ranch way of, of merchandising calves that were going to be sold at auction and I can always appreciate when I get personal contact from people and I think that uh, your customer base may also appreciate that kind of contact as well. Of course today you know this listing um, or advertisement if you will from Facebook is the modern way of sharing data uh, and information on the internet and here's a great example from one seed stock provider that was helping to merchandise uh, his customers' calves. This is David Rattan here in the photo. And, um, you know, really good set of cattle with all the management aspects taken care of. And then this bit of marketing uh, done on the internet is really, you know, putting the icing on the cake. And I mean, what else can you do besides show, you know, that we've checked every box, we've got some photos. And by the way, here's a photo of the man behind the cattle. You know, that's, that's exciting marketing. And maybe not all of us want to be on Facebook or social media to do that, but uh, that's the modern world. And if there's a way that you can gain an advantage, you know, it's, it's pretty cheap to do so on the web. So that's where I think we ought to be with our marketing. And with that, Carol, I'm going to uh, stop the share on time and turn it back to you. We do have a handful of questions who have come in, or that have come in, Paul. So let's uh, take a few minutes to go through those. Um, one question specific to your slide early on with the scatter plot. Um, if I'm a producer who is not able to retain ownership, how do I capitalize on that $14 a hundred weight premium without taking on that additional risk? Well, I think it's going to require some risk at some point in time in order to gain the information on the cattle at least. There are plenty of ranchers, farmers across the U.S. that have less than a load lot of cattle to sell, maybe don't have the uh, you know, ability to take on the risk of feeding cattle, but there are also ways to send five head or 10 head in a certain direction and get those cattle fed. First of all, you're going to gather the information uh, about what they really will do in the feed yard and on the rail. And second of all, 
you may find out that you actually, you know, have that advantage that you, you know, deserve that premium and will get that premium. You don't have to have a load lock, folks. You can definitely work with a small feed yard that will maybe commingle the cattle, send some cattle on a feeding test somewhere or, or what have you. But, you know, you, you don't have to take all the risk in the world. Maybe you send a few head out of your calf crop and, and do a little trial where, and still send the rest of them through your traditional marketing app. Very good. Now, Paul, you talked through several different program options for for ranchers. Um, what if I'm a stalker? What programs are available to a stalker operator, um, perhaps without history on lightweight calves purchased at a sale barn? Obviously we have VQA. Um, what else is out there for those stalkers? Well, if, if, there's, if the history of the cattle is unknown, then of course we're kind of behind the eight ball because we can't go back and reinvent some things that aren't there. So if, if the cattle are purchased with unknown history, then I'd say, you know, just do the best you can and sort them up and, and, and push them into the, the marketing channels that you think will be the most profitable. But we've sure stripped away some of our ability to, uh, to, to make any claims about the cattle if, if we don't have that, that information behind us. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the slide you shared with the bar chart talking about return on investment of weaning. Can you explain why a shorter duration wouldn't offer a return on investment? Um, wouldn't you traditionally consider weaning even if just for a few weeks better than weaning on the truck? I would personally, uh, I, I defer first of all to the cattle feeders, but in the group, but I have had some experience and in, in from my observation, you know, that first week after weaning, uh, we're really accomplishing nothing from a, from a daily game perspective. We're just getting calves acclimated to the new environment. Uh, of course, they're still balling for a couple days, finding the water tank and um, learn how to lay down and be calm. The first week is, is kind of blown out of the water uh, in terms of return. So we really need to get, and I think that, that continues through that first month to a degree. We need some time in that setting where the calves can start to gain. Now the extra value, however, is also tied to the fact that it's the 45 day wean calf that the customer wants to pay more for. A 30 day wean calf still represents a health risk to the buyer. A 45 day wean calf really has, there's an entirely different perception about the potential health outcome with that animal. And I think that's a big portion of that value differential that we saw on that chart. Obviously changing the direction of the kind of feeder cattle quality being produced is a significant time commitment. Um, if that change is made, what do you believe the outlook will be um, for the current demand of high quality feeder cattle? Will that high demand continue? I don't think there's a reason to bet otherwise because we have no other indicator today that suggests that it will or should change. And the indicators that have gotten us to where we are today, understanding that a high quality, well marbled carcass is what the consumer will pay more for, those signals came to us over a very long period of time it, with intentional change made by per, the entire production sector uh, and responding to the economic signals that the packers have sent back through the, through the grid and, and the value chain. So if there's another direction to chase, I certainly don't know what it is. And for my money, I would just double down today, pursuing more of the best traits that we know are profitable right now. You talked a lot about um, all the different value we can add and document. Um, if I am owning those cattle all the way through the process, does that added value matter to the packer? No, the, well, the added value comes through, let's say when you merchandise cattle, maybe they do go into a program requiring the documentation, whether it be a non-hormone treated program, a natural program, yes, the packers are paying premiums for those. There's a reason that the feeders are paying a premium for the feeder cattle as well. So if you retain the ownership, you'll get paid for those. Now, if you want to capitalize on every attribute of the cattle, if it's the daily gain, if it's the feed efficiency, obviously that's money kept in your pocket through the feeding segment and you've got to merchandise the cattle on a, on a quality-based grid in order to capitalize on, on the carcass quality that you put in. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we've got time, it looks like, for one more question. So we'll take this last one. Um, can you provide any tips for 
the best way to reach out to busy feedlot operators to begin to build those relationships to market calves? Um, what ways do they value the most? I think that's my favorite question because I tell you what, the cattle business, one of the reasons a lot of us remain in this business, as insane as it might seem at times, is it's a people business. Now, people come in all different shapes and sizes in terms of personality, but I can assure you that there is, there, there's a plethora of cattle feeders out there that would love to hear from the, the next rancher that has a high quality set of cattle that they have not laid their hands on yet. Because that, as a buyer, if you sit in and try to look through a catalog of calves for sale or yearling cattle for sale and put your finger on those that are actually worth your bid, it can be very daunting because you just don't have enough information. So if someone were to reach out to the, to the feed yard and just say, hey, I, I want to get to know you because I think I have cattle that might meet your requirements. I don't think you'll get very many doors closed in your face and certainly 10 out of 12 phone calls, I think will go very well. If to find the resources, you can start with us at Certified Angus Beef on our website, CAB Cattle, or just make some calls to some universities, some state cattlemen's organizations, feed salesmen, uh, pharmaceutical salesmen. These folks will help you out if they can. Super. Well, that's all the time we have to answer live. I know we still have some pending questions down there. Paul, we may have you uh, work on typing up some chat responses to those during the break, but we certainly appreciate uh, all the, the very useful, tangible information you've been able to share with us. Um, I think this is all very, very applicable to those commercial ranches who are truly the foundation of our beef supply chain. So Paul, thank you very much. Thank you, it's been my pleasure.